December 8, December 17th, 1995. I'm about to, uh, this is Mary Allison on December 17th, 1995. I'm about to interview uh, Jeremiah Gutman. Let's first get a little background sure. information. How long have you lived in Hastings? Since 1954. 41 years. Right. Oh, that's a long time. Were you always at Riverview Manor? Riverview, Riverview Place? Yes. We bought that house then, and uh, I've lived there ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a Spanish Mediterranean style house right. at number two. That's right, right. Riverview at the end Place. Of the street. Uh huh. You have a be beautiful view of the Hudson. Oh, yeah. Does your daughter still have that kind of wild garden out in front? Out in back, yes, a well front back as you wish, on the riverside. Oh, yeah, on the riverside. Well, yeah, we I remember call, seeing that. that. We call that Rebecca's South Quarter. Okay, I remembered your two da daughters came over here to do some research, probably five or six years ago. Uh -huh. I remember one was Rebecca. What was and it? the other one was Thea. Thea, okay. Right. I've been trying to remember right. her name but they were doing research on some sort of an environmental project. I oh, can't I remember just what it was. Something to do with the river, I think, and the pollution mm -hmm. uh, in it. Does that sound right? Sounds absolutely right. right. Just like okay. Well, yeah, uh, I have four daughters. <laughs> oh, well, those are the two that I met. That's right. So who are the other two? Uh, Thea's the oldest. Uh, she's one of those. Unit. The next in line is Mara, who is a nurse and lives in uh, the Boston area. Oh. And has a couple of kids. Whereabouts in the Boston area? She lives in Brookline. Oh, okay. And she's a geriatric nurse. Uh huh. I grew up in Wellesley, Massachusetts, oh. so I wondered if it maybe it was the Wellesley Newton Hospital. No, she's um, with, uh, oh, I've been to the hospital. It's a, it's a geri geriatric rehabilitation center, part of or associated with Mass General. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And next is Rebecca, the one you know. Uh -huh. And then the youngest is Malika. Malika. Who is a sophomore in college. She graduated oh. from Hastings High about two years ago. Oh, where is she in school? New Pulse. Senior. New Pulse. Mm hmm Okay, why did you happen to come to Hastings? Well, oh, it was lovely and I wanted to get out of the city and I wanted to be close to it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the same as <laughs> <stockade, laughs> too. Yeah. Uh, now, we know where you live. I know you're a lawyer. Right. And you're associated with the ACLU, right. American Civil Liberties Union. Are you New York or are you the National? Both. I'm oh, you're both. All right. I was formerly uh, president of the New York affiliate, New York State affiliate, for many years, and uh, I was uh, uh, vice president of the National for several years, and I am um, on the board of directors of both of them. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was trying to figure that out. I remembered. I certainly got letters from you over the years, and I. So, well, maybe it's national. No, is it it's New York State? Oh, right, well, that's why. And I was legal director of Westchester for many years, also. Oh my! How could you keep so many roles going at once? <laughs> With difficulty. Yes, I should think so. Well, now let's talk about your war experiences. Did you? Uh, how did you happen to get into the military? One didn't have any choice in those days. I was uh, at CCNY uh, in Manhattan. I entered the city at uh, 1938 or 9, and uh, I joined the ROTC, Reserve Training Corps. And they had an infantry unit there. And um, I stayed in college until I was graduated, which was in, I forget, 42 or 3. And uh, from there, I uh, went into service. Um, but the ROTC graduates had been so poorly trained and uh, were having such high casualty rates that I was in the first class coming out of city where they said, well, we're not going to give you commissions. We're going to send you to uh, uh, officer's training uh, school at Fort Benning, so that's where they sent me first. Mm -hmm. 
And um, having grown up in New York City with its multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic backgrounds, uh, I had never experienced anti-Semitism until I got to the Army. And I was the only uh, Jewish person in the entire class of ROTC students in mm. which I was. And, uh, that must have been a rude awakening. It certainly was. <laughs> From the, the officer's training school, um, they had a system by which they called them. They, they had buddy sheets. Everybody rated everybody else in you know, units of 40 uh, as to what, what kind of officer they thought would be. And I came in last on everybody's list. I had 100% in every single grade, did everything one was supposed to do. Was, uh, and uh, I came in last on everybody's list, which meant I washed out. So they made me a corporal, and because I'd had four years of ROTC infantry training, uh, they sent me to an infantry unit in, uh, in uh, Camp Shelby, Mississippi. That must have been another blow. Well, to go to <laughs> the deep south. Well, <laughs> I had wanted to go in. I could have stayed out um, because my eyes were not good, but. Um, and they were sufficiently bad so that I could have stayed out. But I took special training for my eye muscles so that I would pass these things. So, of course, I, I mm. really wanted to get in. I didn't think it was uh, decent not to fight Hitler. <laughs> you know. So, uh, and my father was in a position to uh, have me assigned uh, because business connections. Um, he, he was in a position to have me assigned to Governor's Island where they were making movies, mm -hmm. uh, propaganda movies for the American armed forces. Uh, but I said, uh, I, did, I asked him not to do it. And, 
uh, because, I, again, I thought it was uh, inappropriate to take some cushy job. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan was part of that unit. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I'm, I, yes, I, I remember I, now. Uh, uh, yeah. the, the danger there was you might get seasick on the ferry ride to, this, to post the post. <laughs> <laughs> Tough. <laughs> Anyway, so I ended up in Camp Shelby with the 69th Infantry Division, and um, I trained with them down there and um, ran into racism. Uh, one, one day I was uh, waiting at a bus stop to go on a two-day pass from Shelby down to Biloxi, and uh, a young black man from the army, there was no blacks in all my unit, of course, it was a segregated army in those days, but he was in another black unit somewhere else in around Shelby, and he and I were talking, and the local uh, sheriff's office separated us, and uh, because we weren't supposed to be in the same area waiting for a bus, and uh, they put him into a black area and they put me on a bench and they put a, a deputy to stand with me so that I couldn't uh, communicate with him or be with him until the bus came and they put me on the bus and they told me not to come back. So that was my first experience with racism in the area. <laughs> Boy, is that kind of thing common? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, you know, years later I, uh, in, in the 60s I was active in the civil rights movement in the South. I, I a lawyer with the Lawyers Constitution Defense Committee, and uh, <laughs> that kind of racism was, was prevalent. Mm. At any rate, so eventually the 69th Infantry uh, was uh, sent to combat, and I went with them. By that time, I was a rifle squad leader. And where were you sent? I was sent into France, and France into Germany, to, uh, France into Belgium, Belgium into Germany. This would have been in the end of 44? Yes. So you with, went through that awful winter oh, of 44, yeah. 45? Yes. Yes. Where were you at that time? We, we, we had some uh, fighting uh, in, eastern, uh, in eastern Belgium on the, uh, Belgium on the German border. Uh, took a lot of casualties. Um, I, uh, I was small. I could speak a decent French. I could speak some German. Uh, so they used me, uh, aside from normal combat duties, um, I, was, uh, I was sent out a lot on patrols. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, I would see what you can find out, they give you specific things, what, what units there were, what, 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 whatever we could see to bring back and tell them. And so and I That must have been pretty dangerous. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what war is about. Yeah. And I was good at it because I was small and um, uh, multilingual and um, I knew my way around and I always brought my men back, which was not the case with a lot of other people. How big were those patrols? Three or four? Oh, the, the largest was 12. Oh, that many? Um, sometimes you would do what they would call a reconnaissance in force, which is the most unpleasant kind of patrol. A reconnaissance in force uh, is designed to draw fire so that you can see what kind of uh, what kind of the opposition you're going to get. <clears throat> so sometimes we'd go out with just two or three or four people to see what you could see. Sometimes you'd go out with a job of capturing somebody so you could bring back a prisoner. And sometimes you'd go out uh, to uh, commute, to uh, disrupt communications. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'd go out in the reconnaissance of force. Reconnaissance in force? That's what it's called. Oh. Well, it was in those days. I don't know what they call it now. Yeah. I hadn't heard of that kind of yeah. reconnaissance before. Yeah. So that's that's the sort of thing uh, we did. And uh, uh, we were uh, 
We took a lot of casualties. I was wounded a few times, and um, I got a few medals for being stupid. Were you ever uh, injured? Yes, I was wounded a few times. Three times? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, a few times. Say, a few times. Actually, we, we counted them up uh, a few years ago. I met with a very few of us. Very few of us survived of our, of our platoon of uh, originally 40 people. Uh, only three survived, and uh, all of us have been wounded at least once. And uh, we had a lot of replacements over the years we were in combat. And uh, a lot of them would die very quickly because of lack of experience. They'd come up and be dead within a day or two because <coughs> you learn by being there and sometimes you don't get time to learn. Did they send you back to Paris to recuperate Never. or just field hospitals? Never. Never even to a field hospital. Really? The farthest I ever got back to was the dining aid station because uh, I didn't want to leave the unit. A sense of camaraderie develops. Uh, <clears throat> none of my wounds were sufficiently serious, fortunately, so that I was uh, never, never, never had to go back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the worst, or the worst, most serious wound I ever had was uh, uh, towards the end of the war near Leipzig uh, because of the uh, uh, stupidity, if not cowardness and drunkenness of our commanding officer. We were ordered to make an attack, which we shouldn't have been able to do. And I, I, during the course of that, we lost almost everybody in the outfit. And um, I had a, uh, uh, my, uh, a piece of uh, artillery shell. We, we were at, we, a, a company, that is, uh, couple of hundred people and was supported by one tank with 37 millimeter gun we were ordered to attack uh, a, uh, an anti-aircraft installation which was defended by a battalion which mm -hmm. is, uh, I don't know much about strategy but that uh, just sounds kind of like, foolhardy to me it certainly was and uh, they leveled the anti-aircraft guns at us, and the pieces of flak that were coming were designed to shoot down airplanes, and, and when they hit them, they, you know, we had a lot of very bad serious oh. people. And I got, and I got knocked unconscious, and I got hit on the side of the head. I'm not sure how long that was out. <clears throat> how did the engagement end? We withdrew. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, uh, I put my commanding officer, as a matter of fact, after we uh, that horrible scenes of war was, we were coming back across this field, which had been, it was very, the ground was very soft and plowed. <clears throat> and uh, I was one of the last people off. And the, um, and so we jumped down into the road, uh, which was below grade. Uh, there was the company commander, a captain, and he said, uh, pretty rough out there, sergeant? And I said, if you put your yellow head up and take a look, you wouldn't have to ask me. Uh, so. I tried to have him court-martialed for cowardice and drunkenness because I'm convinced he was drunk when he ordered the attack. Hmm. That got nowhere. They told me they sent me to the chaplain. Well, <laughs> 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 uh, one of the interesting things that, um, that happened during the course of uh, and that, that particular firefight reminds me of it because uh, the reason that any of us survived is that the so-called 5th Platoon, <clears throat> which had been attached to our company, came out and uh, was responsible for saving a lot of us. It sort of covered your retreat? Yeah, and brought in wounded. Mm. Uh, the 5th Platoon, 
two, a rifle company is ordinarily four platoons, or what in those days. <clears throat> and um, we, about several months before this fight at Leipzig, we had been back uh, on the German border and uh, had been pulled into uh, a reserve position after some very heavy fighting on the, uh, the Siegfried line. Um, and um, a, um, the captain called us together in a barnyard. We were about two or three miles behind the front line. The Rutsch was better than being in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he said that we'd been selected because we were uh, very honored. He was a officer from Baltimore, from uh, Baltimore was blue and gray, and uh, rebel and, uh, and uh, loyalist, and uh, therefore uh, he had been selected as the company commander for a new experiment. And the experiment would be that a fifth platoon of all black soldiers, all Negroes was the word used in those days, all Negro soldiers would be added to our unit uh, to see whether they could fight. And uh, he assured us we didn't have to fraternize with them, we didn't have to have anything to do with them, and uh, that they would always wash their mess gear in the water after we had washed our mess gear, so we didn't have to worry about that, and, but that they would be in our put, uh, they would, this fifth platoon would be added, and he said that uh, they were going to be arriving in the next day or so and that um, uh, we should just put up with them and um, that um, he, he, he wanted us to know that he would never uh, expose us to a situation where we would have to depend upon them. He would use them only in reserve in the most desperate situation. That's mm -hmm. how integration was commenced in the U.S. Army. I That's guess it wasn't integrated until after the war, was That's it? Right. Didn't I do it? No, Truman. Was it Truman? Mm -hmm. Anyway, the fifth platoon came That's up there. That's right. Very That's how I do it. Yeah, yeah, it was Truman. Uh, and the uh, uh, fifth platoon was added to us. They were all um, uh, men who had taken voluntary reductions in rank to private first class from staff sergeant or higher. Staff sergeant is four stripes. So they'd given up at least three stripes in order to become privates first class, in order to demonstrate that Negro troops could fight. They had a white officer, of course. <laughs> That's what Harold told me. <laughs> and um, they ran it to us, and uh, they were never uh, committed to a fight until at some point, we're in a little town at the confluence of the Vesa and Vera rivers, a town called Halmunden. And How do you spell that? Do you remember? Sure. H-A-N-M-U-N-D-E-N. Halmunden. Wait a minute. Get, say that again. H? H-A-N. H-A-N-M-U-N-D-E-N. Halmunden. That's in Belgium? No, that's in Germany. Mm -hmm. The fight, this, this incident at Han Munden happened, well, probably six weeks after the 50th lunar ride. Would that have been when, January 45? Good guess. We didn't count calendars, just one day after the other. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like uh, it is uh, where you get. In, in subsequent wars where men were drafted or sent over for tours of a year or two, you knew that when it was over, if you lived, you could go home. This was the uh, Second World War, was, as they used to say, for the duration. The question was, which would do, <laughs> which would have a longer duration, you or the war? Yeah. <laughs> the odds were that the war would outlast you because these infantry outfits that I was in with, so we took a lot of casualties. 
So you were in on the invasion of Germany. Oh, yeah. yeah our unit, as a matter of fact, uh, crossed the Remagen Bridge before it was blown up. Oh, really? You did? We crossed it and came back. Oh. Huh. I took a uh, trip up the Rhine some years yeah. ago. It was kind of a junket. I was working on a travel magazine at the time, and so I really had had no idea, had no desire to go to Germany. But anyway, it was a free trip, and we saw the we took a trip up the Rhine and saw this bridge. And one of the men in our group, I think there were ten of us, had been on the in the unit that first crossed that bridge. It must have been in the '69. I guess so, I can't yeah. remember. But he told us such a vivid tale of what it was like. But he ended up marrying a German girl, so there was no, no rancor. But he told us this hair-raising tale of crossing the bridge with mm -hmm. bombs falling all around. Yeah. So, <laughs> at any rate, let me get back to Han Munden, which is mm -hmm. farther, way farther later in the story. Uh, we we attacked, uh, but no, no we, we went into the village, the village was quiet, and uh, we had specific orders. There was a big factory in the town, and we were told we didn't know what to meet there, of course, but um, I was by active platoon commander, and because people would be killed. And I had orders not to damage that factory because that was, tell me why, they just said, don't damage that factory. Turned out later it was owned by the Ford Motor Company. Huh. What were they manufacturing I then? Don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, we went into that town and uh, it was an ambush and uh, we got pinned down and uh, we, uh, one of the sources of fire was from the, <laughs> that factory. And uh, the camp, the, the, um, our commanders behind us sent up to his uh, additional units to relieve us. Uh, we were at a point. And uh, they, the second platoon, they sent up the first and the third platoons to relieve us. And they got pinned down. The fourth platoon is a weapons platoon, and you can't use that very well. So he uh, sent up sent the, up the he sent up the company runner to tell us to withdraw. And withdrawal would have been very difficult because it's not getting up. You're going to lose some more men. And we were contemplating how to carry out that order with, to withdraw when suddenly the fifth platoon which had been behind the weapons platoon without getting any orders on their own, came in. And they were just, <laughs> it was a wave of humanity and they just, they swept right over us and through us and, and, and they took some casualties. But they, they lifted the, the, the people who were pinning us down and we took, we took on them. Mm, I hope they got recognized. Yeah, sure. They got balled out for attacking without orders. That's what happened to them. <laughs> they didn't get more martial. They just got reprimanded. And uh, it was this same 5th platoon, which uh, years later, well, not months later, in that attack that I talked about, of course, that open field outside of Leipzig, um, that was in the town of Gross Gordon. Uh, G R O S S. One S. G R O S Gordon G O R E N. G. <coughs> it was the fifth platoon again, which came out after we had been you know, we attacked this artillery battalion. Uh, it's an aircraft battalion and it's def defended by a battalion of infantry. Uh, they, they came out and they, uh, they carried our wounded back and 
made it possible for a few of us to get out of there. Hmm. Uh, Did they, were they recommend, acknowledged this time? Yeah, two of them were put in for uh, stars or something. <coughs> life of an infantry soldier is so episodic because times will go by when you just do nothing but walk and walk and walk and walk for days on end and sometimes you do nothing but stay in a spot hole in a fixed position mm -hmm. for days and days and days on end when the main enemy is cold and wet. One fellow I talked to uh, <coughs> said the thing he remembered what most about that period was how cold. That's a thing, right. He said he thought he'd never get warm again. I, I, my feet were frozen and I still have problems because of that. The blood vessels in the feet once they froze. That's what he, exactly what he had too. Yeah. He said he never really quite got over it. No, you never do. No. Well, I never do. I can't, I can't go on ice and so on. Mm. Uncomfortable. Uh, I don't suppose you had sleeping bags, or, or did you? We had uh, shelter halves. Shelter? Shelter halves. Each soldier carried a half a shelter tent. Oh. Uh, if there ever came a point, which you, I can't recall it ever happening except once. Was it like a pup tent? Yeah, each had a half, each man carried half a tent, and you you could use it yourself by spreading it on the ground, using like a ground sheet, and and then rolling it over yourself. But if you had the luxury of being able to be above ground or, or even show a little profile above the ground, uh, you find another guy with a shelter half, and you could put your sticks through the holes. And up it down and then tie the, you get a stick and the two shelter heads could go up and you'd have a little uh, uh, v-shaped tent mm -hmm. out of the two halves that's what they call it the shelter half yeah i never heard of that uh, before each of us had a shelter half huh. hmm. we, we each had when we were fully loaded you had 75 pounds of equipment blanket and shelter half and so on and some food yeah C's or D's rations. Hmm. Well, oh, uh, that was pretty awful. <laughs> and where where did you go after after you got it to? Um, let's see. I guess this would be in West Germany. No, in East Germany. We we ended up. Uh, the uh, Elbe River, the 69th Division, went all the way through and made the contact with the Russians. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah, I've forgotten a lot of this. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we were an active group. <laughs> yeah. Well, you uh, saw a lot of activity there. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, there were, uh, as I was saying, the, the episodes come to mind rather than the specific, rather than the sequence and and events because when you're a, a lowly infantryman, uh, I ranged in, in command from assistant squad leader to acting platoon leader, and you, you're not very conscious of anything except a few hundred yards around you at the most. Mm. You're lucky if it's that much. So uh, we didn't have any large strategic 
views of what was going on in the world, just you know, conscious of what was going on in the world, immediate vicinity. Did you, you know, I was just going to ask you, didn't know what was going elsewhere in Germany? Of course not. We knew nothing. Even the new Stars and Stripes, the IRGI paper, never came up to us. Hmm. We never, we never. Uh, all of this stuff was primarily propaganda stuff. We didn't get it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was one point uh, right on the Belgian-German border where we, uh, we weren't getting cigarettes. And that was a major, major... Cause of complaint. <laughs> Worse than that. Yeah. Uh, and a rumor came back uh, to us that the um, company command post had cigarettes in the kitchen. The kitchen was about a mile and a half or two beyond the front line where we were. And uh, the way we worked things in those days was we were on the line, we lived in the holes, and uh, the company would send up food uh, once a day, uh, eat cold food in the meantime, once they sent up hot food. And the deal was that you took turns with a buddy. He would go and get hot food. He would eat it there hot. He would then fill up mess kit, cover it up, and then bring it back to you. So you would get lukewarm food. <laughs> and then you'd take the next night. You would go and get the hot food and uh -huh. so on. Uh, well, uh, so, and the kitchen itself, which prepared the hot food, was a mile or two behind that. So the rumor was that there were cigarettes back there at the kitchen. So what we did was I worked out a deal with the uh, squad leaders on either side of me. We thinned out our positions so that they covered my squad. And I took my squad back to the kitchen. And we, it was in a house. So we, uh, the kitchen is in a house. And we, so we, we approached the kitchen as though it were an enemy objective, as though we were occupied by an enemy. We got ourselves into position, and um, they weren't expecting us. <laughs> and I uh, said to, uh, I, I called out the, the, uh, the chief cook of the I don't even know his name. He was just called the Greek. So I said, Greek, I hear you got cigarettes. I ain't got no cigarettes. I said, Greek, I hear you got cigarettes. When we want here. cigarettes, we're here to get cigarettes. He said, get that one out of here. You know, worse than that. And so what I did is I had my, my we had one automatic weapon in the squad, a dining automatic rifle. So I said to the BAR man to fire a burst above the window where the Greek had been talking to us from. So he did that. He fired. He squeezed off four or five rounds and went over the Greek's head into the house. The Greek threw out two cases of cigarettes. <laughs> we took them back up front <laughs> and shared them out among the three squads. My goodness. That's the luxury of frontline living. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't even make a fire in your foxholes. Oh, no. Oh. And to light a cigarette, you would... Uh, Have to get under your you, coat? You put your... You put you get down in the hole, you put the shelter half over the top, and you'd light the cigarette while you're in the hole. And then, once you had it lit, you could come up and you'd cut. Mm. So how long did that go on? In that particular position on the German border, I guess we were there for a period of so, three weeks, I don't know, something like that. And, 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 and then you started to cross Germany? And we started to cross Germany, yeah. Did you meet much resistance from oh, sure. locals? Oh, no. Mostly the army. It was mostly the army, except at the very end. At the very end, we, we were fired on quite frequently by uh, 
old men and young boys. Hmm. Last stand. Last stand. It was very sad because you don't like to shoot a 13 or 14 year old boy, but if you shoot them, you don't have much choice. Yeah. So that's what we did. Hmm. The very end of his ugliness. The Germans had been propagandized into thinking that uh, the Russians were beasts and the Americans were depraved and so on and so on, and they were protecting their homes against rape and plunder and mm. mixing with the races. And so these desperate, crazy people ended up getting. And doing us some damage. We took some casualties at the end there when they were disorganized. Mm. These guerrilla units. Mm. They can do a lot of damage. You may see some of that in Bosnia. It's going to be some. They'll be crazy. That's what I. Yeah, they'll be crazy over there. Yeah. Well, what about. Did you have to actually physically meet the Russian army? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, at the very end, uh, while we were waiting for the, for the contacts, we had, uh, we were on the, uh, on the Elba, I'm trying to think of the name of the town we were on, I don't remember the name of the town, the Elba River, the LBE. Uh, we had, we had been very strict, I mean, uh, rules. Uh, we had uh, each, each unit leader was given flares of various colors, mm -hmm. and there were combinations of flares, and they were changed every day or so. If you saw a unit approaching, uh, you saw contact, uh, uh, and you thought they might be Russians, you would set off your flares in a certain combination and sequence, and then they would respond. So you would. The idea was that we didn't want to start a firefight with, with right. the Russians. Uh, we never did get to that, but uh, we were sitting there waiting. Oh, it was a very comfortable thing. We were in the house on right the riverbank. And uh, we uh, finally uh, they set up a uh, road patrol system and they, because I could speak some languages. They put me in charge of a jeep patrol to go out and make contact because the word had come that the Russians were not very far away, a few miles ahead. So um, I took a, 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 a patrol of two jeeps and uh, on my whole squad, 12 of us. And we were armed uh, usual way, plus a 50 caliber machine gun on a swivel post on one of the jeeps. And our job was to make contact. make contact. And we had radios, of course. A radio. It was a radio. And um, we went forward and uh, down the roads. It was very open. We thought, you know, hey, it was all oh, fantastic. Was it kind of rural uh, landscape? Sure. Not woods. Uh, no, it was farm country. Yeah. There were patches of woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got fired on a few times by the kids from the ditches and so on. We didn't have any casualties. We killed a few people and chased a lot more. And uh, we finally did indeed see a unit coming the other way. So we fire off our, our com correct combination of flares and we get the correct answer saying, hey, fantastic Russians. So uh, we immediately radio back that we've made contact. Mm -hmm. I forget what the combination was. You know, you say, oh, well, you never say everything uh, open on the air, you say things code. But at this point, I don't know why, but that's what the rule says. I say whatever I say, two reds and a green, and then I say two whites and a yellow, and I, 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 everything was all right, and then they order, I get an order. It says, 
hope for the further progress, await further orders. Do not move forward. So, good soldiers, we wait, we stop, and we see this unit. It's a mile or two down the road. You know, see it across country, just big shapes, but they have fired the correct flags. And we're stopping, and uh, then we hear of communications going back and forth. We're in the open network that uh, other units will be coming up and we're to permit them to pass us. In other words, we've been sent up to clear the road so that when the chairborns came up, uh, they would be in danger. Our job oh. was, we were, we, were the, we were the minesweepers. <laughs> so, uh, we, well, we, we, we simply disobeyed orders. We went forward mm. because the Russians were coming and we wanted to be there and it was just too much to miss. So right. we, we went forward. In the meantime, uh, they were indeed Russians. They were indeed Russians. I thought you were going to tell me it was no, a no, was maverick Nazi no, it was unit. Russians. It was, that was great. And behind us, as we we're uh, pounding backs and whatnot, uh, about 15 minutes later, well, the, well, the people we called the Chairborne Infantry arrived. That, you know, newspaper people, oh, camera oh, people, PR and people, and all the, and all the, the guys who get, and some of those people indeed got medals for, <laughs> for being, um, they just simply ignored us and then they took pictures of VIPs. No, we, we, I was I later became angry about it at the time. I thought it was just great. Mm -hmm. Were the Russians as equally glad to oh, see you? Sure. <laughs> people have been shooting them for years. Yeah. Just as people have been shooting us for years. We're glad to <laughs> Were you aware of the fall of Berlin by then? Yeah, we'd heard about it. Rumors came back all the time. I mean, we'd, we'd get strange, sometimes in accurate but mostly inaccurate exaggerations of distortion. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, I remember the first word we got of the death of Franklin Roosevelt was that his son had been killed in action. <laughs> That's how the Roosevelt's death came over. Oh my goodness. Which one? That's all we heard. <laughs> you know, of course it was this absurd distortion of truth. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Well, when did you learn of Roosevelt's death? Yeah. Huh. And so there was great uh, elation when you well, met yeah, the Russians. Indeed there was. Indeed there was. But we got shortly after that the battalion intelligence officer told me to get my men back into my jeeps and go back to my unit. Didn't want us peasants interfering with it. Hmm. And I'm sure the Russians had the same kind of thing. The, hmm. the common foot slogger who was up front and took all shouldn't be there when the pictures are being taken. So hmm. I suppose that happened all over. I'm sure. It did. Yeah. Hmm. Well, by this time it was uh, end of April, early May. I was trying to remember just when the VE uh, day was. Was it May 5th? I really don't remember. I think it was April, May, but May. I don't know. I think it was the first weekend in May. In May well, so it was springtime. Mm hmm. Shortly, uh, a couple of, oh, a week or ten days before that, we had been out again with. Started with one jeep with the same 50 caliber machine gun on the swivel. We had been uh, coming back from a patrol. We had been out looking for Russians. We were coming back from a patrol and we saw uh, off to the side of the road, country dirt road, uh, a, um, a bunch of deer grazing hmm. in the field. 
toying around to take a stubble or something. Anyway, we hadn't had any decent meat in a long time, so I decided we would do this. So what I suggested was we stopped the Jeep, we loaded the 50, 50 cal machine gun. I said, that's a 50, 50 cal means that the bullet is a half an inch across at the base. That's, don't ordinarily use should deal with a 50 cal machine gun. What we decided to do, what I decided to do, and I had, we did, is I said to put tracers in the belt, and there was a group of trees behind the deer. I said, let's fire over the deer, and, and then they'll come your way. Right, and we'll, we'll roll fire back, and, and then when they get near, near enough, we'll pick them off with rifles and have meat. So we did that. We fire a burst into the edge of the trees beyond the deer. And to our great dismay and disappointment, out of the woods came a group of about a dozen German soldiers yelling, come on, come on, waving white flag or, or handkerchief. Oh, for and they thought they'd been spotted. And <laughs> I didn't want Germans, I wanted deer. <laughs> so you had to capture them? We had to take the Germans back. Yeah. Did you ever get any deer? We didn't get those. We did get some on other occasions. Oh. But that time we only got Germans and they're not edible. <laughs> well, had they been, uh, were they hiding out as they were hiding out, right. They, they, the Russian, this was towards the very end of yeah. said, and the Russians were coming one direction, we are coming the other direction, and these guys were... They just wanted to save their, what they could. They didn't sign up. Hmm. And the, the Germans were, at that time, very anxious to surrender to Americans or British or French rather than to the Russians because they were afraid of what happened to them in Russia. Yeah. For good reason, apparently. So anyway, that's how we, we captured a bunch of Germans out there. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, then what uh, did you stay on the Elba for the until you were sent home, or no? Uh, we stayed there not very long, uh, and I had. And from there, I did, once VE Day started, I was, was official, um, they started to break up the units based upon how many points you had towards getting home for every month you get a point. And for every month overseas you get an extra point. For every medal you got, you get five points and that sort of thing. I don't know. So I, I had a lot of points. So they. And they broke us up, they broke up the 69th, and they sent me to the 29th at Bremerhaven, mm. in Northern Germany. And I was there for a few weeks. And from there I came home. When I was in Bremerhaven, I organized, I had nothing much to do, so I went. <laughs> Excuse me. Where are we? Well, See you up in Bremerhaven. Oh yeah, and I, they they asked for volunteers for people who had theatrical experience. So uh, I made some up, and uh, <laughs> they put me in charge of putting the show on. So that's oh. what I did. I organized and produced a show. Oh fun! Yeah, and we it was a musical. And we we did. Um, we traveled around among the British and American forces mm. in the Bremerhaven enclave. We had two shows. One was a, a theatrical you know, presentation for those places where they had a theater. And the other was kind of a nightclub uh, mm. boil down of it, which we did for officers' clubs and so on. Oh. Did you, uh, what was it about? Oh, can you remember? Skits about the army life. It was just uh, childish, sophomoric stuff. Yeah, but it. Uh, but it was fun. Yeah. yeah. It depends on what talent we had. We had, we had guys who could sing and play the guitar. Were there any wax? They never got near the enlisted men. Oh no. No. Hmm. The wax was for the officers. <laughs> huh. That was our experience. Yeah. Well, now, 
was that it was a major deparkation port, I presume. Yes, yes. yes. Even if it had been for the immigrants a century exactly. before. Exactly. So, uh, so when you uh, got back to the States, were you uh, discharged yes. shortly thereafter? Matter of fact, on the way back, one of the ships in our convoy. Uh, yeah, I was on the way back. One of the ships in the convoy broke in half. <laughs> I, was, oh. I wasn't on that ship. Well, those the ships they built in those days were welded, and uh, the this, this, this ship, two parts, came apart. And they just started to float separately. I never heard of such a thing. Yeah. They, they picked them up. Nobody was injured. But, uh, Good heavens, I never heard of a boat coming apart. <laughs> what Maybe they were stuck with an iceberg or something like that, but well, just well, in a calm it, ocean? Well, oh, it wasn't a calm ocean. It was a North Atlantic storm. Oh, my goodness. Hmm. What an adventure. <laughs> but I wasn't on the broken ship, so that's... <laughs> yeah. So you were in the Army for, what, about three years? Yes. Mm -hmm. Nearly four. So where, where did they send you when you came back? To Fort Bragg or? Dix. Or Dix. Yes. And so you were discharged? Got discharged from Dix and took a bus home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and where was home at that point? New York? New York. Mm -hmm. When I left for the Army, my family had lived was living in Queens, and uh, during the war then moved into Manhattan, that's where I came home to. Mm -hmm. Was it a surprise for them, or did you let them know oh, they were coming? Oh, no, no, no surprise, I can't get in touch with them. So you weren't very informed about what was going on once you got to Europe? Not at all. Were you aware of the war in the Pacific and about any of the things going on there? No. No? No. Just hmm. no thing. Hmm. And I was a fairly uh, active person in, in keeping informed before I went into the military. As a matter of fact, in, uh, in Shelby, before we went over, they made me, because I read newspapers and knew what was going on and so on, they made me um, uh, orientation non-com for the entire regiment. So I used mm -hmm. to, uh, as part of the training, uh, once or twice a week, I don't know, they'd meet in areas and I would give lectures as to what was going on in the newspapers and what the war was about, where it was going. That was must have been, been very difficult not to, not to be informed. Sure. We were just, you know, a little sector, and... And that's where life evolved. Right. Life evolved. <laughs> Sometimes life was strictly the hole you were in. Right. Were you were involved in any of the uh, freeing of the concentration camps? Not concentration camps, but slave camps, yes. Um, at one point... Uh, This is in pretty far east Germany. Uh, I had been, I was sent out again because I could speak some language. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a report that there was some violence and disorder at some point in the area we had just occupied. <clears throat> so they sent me uh, with my squad two jeeps to uh, restore order. And we got to this area. It turns out it was a big farm, and uh, the farm had uh, a, a group of slaves who were Russians and Polish, uh, mostly. Uh, there were a couple of Spaniards there. Uh, who were farm laborers, and now that the American army had come through there, they were rebelling, and they had um, they had the, the German farm family in the farmhouse, and the slaves had surrounded the farmhouse, 
and they were threatening violence. And the, the, the farmers had got out, got a message out to the military to come and save them. With my job to come and save them. Well, I uh, I spoke to try to restore order and keep the people from killing anybody. And I went into the farmhouse and I spoke to the family. And I learned that these were the these people outside were animals. They only looked like human beings. They were, they were slaves. They couldn't be counted on for anything. And, and I had to save them from these animals. Why well, look at them? They'd been there for a couple of several years already, and they, they even had some children. Can you imagine? And they breed like farm animals. And it didn't surprise me. And mm. so I, uh, I said to the family that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, do what they wanted. They wanted me to either kill or arrest or remove these slaves uh, who were busily helping themselves to whatever there was on the farm. And uh, I said I couldn't do that, wouldn't do that. And uh, I radioed back for the orders, and my orders were to uh, remove the German family, which seemed to me a very sensible thing to do. So that's what I did. I said, you can come with me if you like. We'll take you back to American military post and they'll do something for you there. Or you can stay here. So they eventually they, they decided that they would come with me. Hmm. Except one. One said he would stay and guard the house. It was his choice. I don't know what happened. I was just going to ask you, do you know what would happen? I left them there. I don't know what happened. Hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if they killed him. He'd been a slave hmm. master. How did they come to be slaves? Well, they were people, one of, two of them were, were Russian um, uh, seamen, uh, naval people. One of them, as a matter of fact, gave me the emblem from his cap, which I was uh, They had been captured, and they had oh, been assigned to, the, to this work. Oh, I see. Uh, I spoke to them. Uh, They'd been sort of prisoners of war. They were prisoners of war being used as slave laborers. Hmm. And I, uh, I've only s seen a little reference to that. Yeah. Uh, there was a, so the concentration camp and the slave labor system was much broader than is generally known. Yes. And I, I communicated with these people in French, in broken French. Yeah. There was a Polish man there who could speak uh, French, German, uh, Yiddish, and Polish. And, uh, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Uh, so that was, the, that's the only experience I had with, uh, with uh, slave labor and concentration camps. Uh, though I did see some concentration camps, so I was never involved in it. You did see some. Mm -hmm. And mm, I could just give you some anecdotes that come to mind once just at, inside the German border we had been in position for a number of days and finally 